Uh, Tracy, do you want to go ahead and get started? And, you know what, uh, let's get started. I just, I told John about these um, round tables. I want to pretend we're just all sitting around the, co the conference table at the dorm. And um, let's just have this conversation. We're going to um, just, you know, explain to you what we're doing virtually at the dorm um, and hear your questions and hear what's going on in your world. I am sitting in Atlanta, Georgia, in my home, and I'm the Director of Outreach and Business Development, and I started with the dorm about two months ago, and when I started, I couldn't wait to get my educational consultant friends on site in both DC and New York City and show you the fabulous staff we have and facilities we have but this is the very next best thing. And I think it's even more exciting to show you how we pivoted to this virtual platform and how we're really answering the call um, during these really unsteady times and we are meeting the needs of our current clients and also able to virtually admit clients that um, are still in a, an escalating mental health crisis. Um, I want to introduce you to Meredith Williams and wave Meredith. She is our marketing magician who makes so much happen behind the scenes. Uh, without her, this wouldn't be, uh, probably wouldn't be running as smoothly, and I know it wouldn't be. And um, she's going to be helping with the slide deck and um, helping with our audio and everything. Um, a lot of you know Miss Sarah Hart, who is our site director, clinical director in D.C., and Dr. Amanda Falk, who is our um, co-founder and site and clinical director in New York. Um, and also I wanna introduce last but not least, our co-founder and CEO, John McGeehan. And all three of them are going to take you through our slideshow today, which is gonna last about 30 minutes. Um, so you can really get a good sense of what we're doing currently at the dorm, which really mimics a lot of what we do in real life. Um, after this presentation, we are going to be able to email you our slides. Um, and so I'll be emailing those to you afterwards. And um, if you have any questions or you wanna meet with us one-on-one -on -one via Zoom, just reach out to me and I'm happy to uh, schedule those meetings because you know your, we know your practices are very unique um, and the needs of your families and clients are very unique. So with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Thanks, Tracy, and uh, thank you, Meredith, for organizing us uh, for this conversation today. So I have the, pl pr the privilege of talking with you all about how we're accepting new clients in this day and age. Um, so it's exciting to be able to talk about some of the experiences we've had over the last couple of weeks since we have transitioned to 100% virtual care, including virtual admissions. Uh, we transitioned on March 17th to, to virtual services. And at that time, we really didn't know how it was going to go. We, you know, all we knew is that the guidance was that it was not healthy to be in the same room and providing therapy for, uh, for clients all together in a group. And we knew our clients were becoming uh, less comfortable with commuting into the office and all that sort of stuff. So we knew it was time to pivot to online and virtual care and took the leap. And I can just tell you that I've been thrilled to see how well our clients have adjusted our clients have adjusted even better than the staff in a lot of ways with the virtual services and we're, we're we'll be some highlighting some of our wins or some of the experiences that we've had that have gone really well uh, <clears throat> over the last couple of weeks and and some of the things that we've learned as well i think uh, we've been we were just talking in staff meeting earlier today about how proud we are of clients learning the technology of Zoom. We're seeing that they're able to be more present in the group rooms and, and really settle into the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, in person as much as we're doing on, on virtual. So just to highlight some of the processes of uh, the admission process, since March 17th, we've admitted eight clients 100% virtually which was also a surprise to us. We, we had the first person call up and say that they needed the services of the dorm and we figured it out. And actually over these last eight sessions, we've, or eight admissions, we've been able to tweak as needed uh, and really hold on to the integrity of what it is that we do at the dorm in our admissions process. 
what we've been doing is we've admitted these eight clients from several different types of programs. We've got a handful of three people from a wilderness program or wilderness programs. We've gotten two people from psychiatric hospitals, uh, two from residential programs, and one was a former client who wanted to reconnect to the dorm. Those folks bring in uh, diagnoses that are really consistent with what we've worked with in, historically at the dorm. We've had folks who are struggling with things like schizoaffective disorder coming to us from the hospital. We've got folks who are struggling with eating disorders. We've got folks who are struggling with mood disorders like bipolar, personality features, uh, and then of course uh, aspects of struggling with their functioning in any kind of way. So we have some folks who know that they need some help getting going with school, some other folks get needing help getting going with work. Uh, so we're bringing in the same types of clients that we've been working with and bringing them in virtually. You, you might already know this about the dorm, but we, we do include a really robust ass assessment process, which includes several different types of assessments, um, which are the biopsychosocial assessment that we have. Uh, we have everybody see our full-time dietitians uh, in, on our teams to do a nutrition assessment. We have folks work with our personal trainers and yoga instructors to do a fitness and uh, a fitness assessment and academic assessments as necessary. We also continue to work with our, our consulting psychiatrists on each team who will continue to see clients uh, virtually as well. So all of those really robust services that we've been able to offer in the assessment process continue. And, and to this, this is a highlight of all of the things that we're doing now virtually. And, and it's funny to think about how we, we talk about this slide because this really is the dorm experience. This, these are all of the things that we've been doing historically since we've been an organization. And we've been able to transition all of these services to the virtual experience. So we'll go through each one in detail a little bit later in the presentation. But to highlight, we have transitioned all of our group therapy sessions. And that might be something you've expected, right? Of course, group therapy and individual therapy as well as clinical coaching. Our clinical coaching is done by licensed therapists. So that is an additional type of skills therapy in addition to the, the psychotherapy that we're doing. We've also gotten really creative though. We've, we've transitioned our clubhouse, which was really the bread and butter of what happens at the dorm. We, both of our brick and mortar locations are, are centered on a, in a clubhouse setting. And we, we, wanted to, we wanted to think about ways that we could maintain that. And actually the, the virtual clubhouse, which will give you more details about what we're actually doing there, uh, was an idea that a client came up with. Why can't we set up a virtual space where we can connect with each other casually in between sessions? We're continuing all the parent coaching and all of the other coaching that we've been doing um, in, in, the, in the virtual setting. We wanted to share with you the New, the New York City group schedule. Just this image alone really speaks to how robust the treatment is that we offer at the dorm. So I know the print is a little bit small and it's hard to see, but I, I want to be able to just call out some of the more unique programs that we're doing. In one way, you know, we've, we've been able to continue really creatively, even continuing to do workouts with dorm fit and yoga sessions with our yoga instructors. Uh, we are continuing to do dinner and supported meals. We're doing some cooking together. Um, we, we continue to do academic supports. So you might be able to see some of these programs that we have on the hour at the, at the New York City location that have been um, really exciting ways to push ourselves and how to utilize uh, the, the, the Zoom technology that we're using. Same thing at DC. You can see we have programming all day, every day in the DC office. We continue to provide opportunities for mindfulness, for art and recreation. We just had a conversation in our team meeting the other day about what are some art rec and art therapy activities that we can do with our clients. And we were, we were talking, some of them only have pens. You know, they don't have a full cabinet of art supplies. So what, we can, what can we do with them virtually? And the team is getting really creative around those types of things. One thing that we're doing is a Zen, uh, Zen what well, now, now I can't remember what they're called. They're Zengrams or something. I'll have to get back to you what they're called. But it's basically following a diagram of, of, of drawing something that's very meditative 
but when you're finished, you have a, an image that makes sense that you can't really predict as you're doing the, the following the lines, which has been really cool. The clients have loved it. Uh, and we're even looking at things like color therapy and, and thinking about how colors impact us. And those are things that we can share when we share our screens and that sort of stuff. So just some examples of the ways that we've been able to translate not only our psychotherapy, our traditional DBT and, and process oriented groups, but some of our other groups here in the, both in the New York and DC schedule. So we also wanted to share with you the, uh, some potential um, levels of intensity when it comes to treatment schedule with our clients. Um, so Meredith, I think you went back and said, yeah, there we go. The sample client schedule. You can see that these are three samples that we put together of, of potential uh, services that we could offer depending on the level of intensity. So you all might know that we have five different tiers of treatment and in those tiers, we offer all day, every day programming at the highest level, but for folks who don't need that much support, they can come in at a more moderate or maintenance level of care. So these are just some examples of what we could put in uh, to a schedule. I like to think about that calendar that we had in the slide before, like an a la carte menu and we can just pick and choose what are the groups that are necessary for our clients based on their clinical needs and what would fit in their schedule? Let's say they're a college student, so they can't necessarily be in an intensive program from 8.30 to 8 p.m., but they could do a moderate program and build some of their scheduling around their class, their existing class schedule. Um, so as, as you can also see, the program always includes an aspect of psychotherapy, but also holistic care, mindfulness, food, nutrition, and, uh, and yoga or exercise support. So to be able to get can I, into- can I interject one? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go, yeah, go, yeah, I'll go ahead. I'll get all my questions by the end, but- um, <laughs> Totally just, get it. Yeah, go ahead. One quick one. Can, can it, do, do they have to be in New York or, or can you guys able to expand this now? So we- awesome. Yeah, we're going to get into that, but that, okay. but the, the admissions that we've had so far, and that's a really good question, we've had folks who have been admitted who still are in places like Dallas, Texas, okay. I didn't or know if Philadelphia. It was a licensing, like, I didn't know, I know they expanded the, expanded that, mm -hmm. I don't think it that way, I don't know if they Yeah, are. you know what, two, two things have happened. We have some, some clients, both in the DC and New York City location, who were existing clients with us who were were in-person clients okay. who may have decided to move home with their parents during this quarantine yeah. or this this pandemic yeah. time so those folks we've got a client in the dc community we've got a client in texas we've got a client in kentucky another client in california so we're we're following the guidance of the the national health emergency where there's there's some um expanding of the laws around telehealth and what they're calling a non-enforcement period, okay. um, which has been really, really helpful. We've yeah. had some new clients coming in. Say, so one of the people who came in from a residential program was planning to move to DC and she still is. Okay. But instead of moving into an apartment by herself in a city where she would be fairly new with limited support, except the supports of the dorm, she decided to move back home to her parents' house in Dallas, and then she's going to move to DC when it's safe to do so. Oh, so it's She'll really relationships and a plan in place and all that. Well, thank you. And then my other quick question back to the schedule is um, the, it says weekly parent calls during this time. If those clients have gone back home, can, can you amp that up to more than once a week? Cause it I could imagine even that's say, really pretty nice. It could yeah. even say daily. If <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah, so the minimum is weekly parent calls. We, we require parents to be involved for all of our clients at least once a week in coaching calls, but for especially those clients who have been moving back home and they're dealing with those parent-child dynamics again, yeah. maybe yeah. for the first time in the last couple of months or even years. Sure. Uh, that client that I was sharing with you that moved back home to Dallas, this is the first time in seven years she's lived with her parents. Oh so you can God. imagine her parents are like, oh my God. And she's oh, yeah. like, oh my God. And so we are doing a lot of supporting of, of all great. of the folks in the family. Um, and yeah. and we'll, we'll talk, we'll highlight too later in the presentation, but we have expanded our supports to seven days a week. So we're talking with all of our clients seven days a week wow. throughout the weekend. And that's the same for parents as well. 
Okay, thanks. Thanks for the questions, Maureen. That's really helpful. So I will pass this off to Amanda to get into some of the specifics around each of the types of services that we, that we offer. Hi guys. Thanks for being here today virtually. Uh, thanks Sarah for, for giving that overview. I'm gonna get into some details around some of the specific services that we are now transitioning to virtual treatment. The first thing I'm gonna talk about is our individual services. So, you know, when we, at the beginning of March, we sort of could see what was on the horizon in terms of needing to transition into a virtual platform. And we really, as an organization, decided to be proactive and to embrace this as a temporary new normal and understand, understood that there were going to need to be certain modifications that we would need to make in a virtual model to compensate for the, the distance, the physical distance that was going to be between us and the clients. So when we looked at individual services, we look at therapy, we look at coaching, we look at family therapy. Therapy, we are doing 100% virtually. Some of our clients have requested and need more touch points for their therapy sessions on a weekly basis, which we are doing. So anything from DBT, CBT, conventional psychotherapy, for our EMDR clients, we've had therapists experimenting with different ways to do EMDR virtually, like doing bilateral stimulation, having the clients uh, tap right leg, left leg, right leg, left leg to get that and create safe space. So it's been uh, a challenge and uh, also really wonderful to sort of work through some of this stuff virtually with clients. For our coaching, which is done, like Sarah said, all by licensed clinicians, all of our life skills coaching, executive function coaching, vocational academic coaching are all done virtually now. What we've added to the mix is that for every single client that we work with, regardless of the intensity level of treatment that they are receiving, we are doing a beginning of day check-in and an end of day check-in. We wanna make sure that we're helping them to keep their sleep-wake cycle very regulated. So the beginning of the day is sort of a check-in and accountability, a planning check-in. And then the end of the day is again a, a bookmark to review the day, what worked, what didn't work, what would they like to do different, and to just review sleep routine for that night. Parent coaching and family therapy, as you noted, Maureen, yes, most of our <laughs> parents and families have needed to increase from once a week to multiple times a week. And we found actually that the families and the parents are participating better now because they have to. And I think they're feeling anxious, they're feeling stressed, having their young adult children home for the first time. And now there's not that barrier where they say, well, I, I can't drive into the city on this night because I have X, Y, or Z. Uh, there's less excuses that they have to use. So they are showing up more to their sessions and also to the groups and workshops that we're offering as well. I don't know if, if all of you know this, but at this point in time, we have full-time dietitians at both sites uh, at the dorm. As a result, we've seen a major increase in the number of eating disorder clients that we service at the dorm. This was an area where we really wanted to hone in when we went virtual and really take good caution and understand what the heightened needs would be for our eating disorder clients. As you guys can imagine, you know, grocery shopping on a normal day is distressing for a client who struggles with an eating disorder. Stocking up on two weeks worth of food is extraordinarily distressing for somebody with a binge eating disorder. So what we looked at was what they needed from a nutritional standpoint and also what they needed from a therapeutic standpoint. For our clients who are receiving meals here on site, we have now started delivering meals to their home. So the dietitians are picking uh, nutritionally appropriate 
meals for their specific clients and their specific meal plans and getting those meals delivered to their homes. We are doing individual meal support virtually, just like we did in person. Again, most of our clients are needing and requesting a little bit more. Group meal support is as scheduled. So we have at least daily virtual meal support groups that are taking place. We've also been doing more social meals, which we did on site as well. But you know, now more than ever, we're really understanding that it's important to be able to sit with a group of peers and have a dinner together. We're having daily breakfast together virtually. We're offering lunches virtually together so that they can sit, they can talk, they can socialize and feel connected to each other. We're doing our cooking group virtually. However, we've added in more sort of com little competitive elements to it where we have cook-offs and clients are presenting their plates virtually and showing what they've made and we're giving out little prizes for creativity and presentation. We had somebody make a pizza, a, a pretzel pizza the other night for the pizza cooking contest. Um, and it's been really nice to watch the clients engage in that type of fun activity. We're doing virtual grocery shopping support for those who need it as well as helping them to order groceries online and do shared screens via Zoom if they need help in that case as well. For our clients who struggle more with the restrictive side, we do have the capacity to monitor uh, their weight to make sure that everything is stable from that perspective. Academic tutoring. Academics are something that have always been a service offering here at the dorm. We have academic specialists on site who assess all clients and help them get set up with uh, services as needed, whether they're on an individual level with course specific tutors, executive function, college advising. We are still doing all of that. What we've noticed is A, our clients who were in college in person are now finishing up college online. And for our clients who weren't in college in person, maybe they were just on leave, they're looking at this time as an opportunity to take some classes online. So the number of clients that we have who are participating in virtual online academic endeavors has increased. And as such, we've had to increase our support that we offer. We're doing daily study halls that are facilitated by tutors so clients can have accountability and have peers to, to study with to help them through that process. It it's, can be very, a very lonely experience to be taking a class by yourself online. We also are understanding that a lot of our clients are wanting to go back to school or transfer schools in the fall. So all of our college advising is taking place virtually as well. Last, and I think this is super important, is that uh, for our clients who have had to leave school and abruptly leave friend groups, uh, maybe not be able to participate in graduations, this is a traumatic experience and it's it's a loss so from a clinical perspective really addressing the the grief process the mourning process and helping them to to process the feelings that go along with abruptly needing to leave uh, an academic environment and not getting to experience certain milestones that they were really looking forward to being able to celebrate Integrative wellness is uh, at the core of what we do. We, we embrace the mind-body connection. Our clients, we have, we have such a robust clinical schedule and sitting in therapy group or skills-based group hour after hour uh, would be too consuming, too overwhelming psychologically for clients. I think that they get more out of groups when they're able to have sessions in between therapy groups that allow them to decompress. So all of our yoga groups, our exercise groups, mindfulness, meditation, Reiki, Zumba, we've transitioned all of these to our virtual platform and we've opened them up to clients to use. 
uh, any client can can step into these services, and they're they're certainly making good good use of them. We've strategically placed these service offerings in areas of the schedule where we feel like clients could really use some downtime and more of a break. Then the last thing that I want to talk about, which Sarah also talked about, and this is, I think, for me, one of the most exciting things that we've been doing. And it's exciting because, you know, the idea largely came from from our clients. When, when we started introducing to our clients at the very beginning of March that we would likely need to be moving to a virtual platform and started practicing with them and, and processing what that would look like, the, their major request was that they wanted to have a virtual clubhouse, just like we have on site in New York and DC, an area where they could hang out and talk to each other and socialize and Obviously, playing pool, playing ping pong isn't necessarily possible right now, but there are certainly other things that they can, they can do together as a group. So every day, we open up a Zoom clubhouse from 9 in the morning till 5 at night that they can drop into and socialize. And they're doing things like uh, board games, walking, talent shows, scavenger hunts, spa, spa nights, painting movies they're bringing their pets in because that's not something that they can do when they're on site due to allergy restrictions so little show and tell with with pet pets making cameos in the clubhouse has been really nice to see and then the last thing and this is a more recent development is that it, as part of what we do at the dorm on a normal basis is we we do volunteering we do service twice a week at a place called Gigi's house which serves individuals who are diagnosed with Down syndrome. And Gigi's house has recently started some virtual volunteer activities and opportunities. So now our clients who were formerly going there in person from the clubhouse together as a group can now do this virtually. The, the first service offering that Gigi's house is doing is called Teen Tastic Nights. So we get on virtually with their clients and really do mostly socialization type activities, dancing and board games. And our clients are, are excited to have that back up and running. Can I ask a question? I'm sorry, another one, Amanda. <laughs> um, for the, for the, game, or the um, virtual whatever room there, um, so they don't know each other, right? I mean, most of them. So it's just, is it like as someone comes into the program, is there a big introduction? Like how, are, how do they kind of, because that's a, such a weird, you know what I mean? It's like, how do you still connect? You know, I know the connection, we're all working on this now, but like, you know, how is that gone? Like, how's that been? I'm curious. Well, they actually do know each other. Oh, and they, yeah. they know each other because for our clients who were with us in person before we went virtual, Right. Well, those, yeah. Yeah. for the newer clients, they are getting to know each other in their normal groups. The, the eight right. new clients who admitted are in a lot of groups throughout the day. So they're getting to know each other uh, in relationships group, in process group, in yoga, in cooking group. And yeah. for them, I think what's been interesting for, I'll speak for myself to watch is that it's using technology to connect mm -hmm. is something they're very used to. I know, yeah. So yeah. For them, the transition hasn't been as overwhelming or difficult, I think, as it is even for, for us in that it's, it's something that they do on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, you know, we're really carefully tracking attendance rates. We're tracking retention rates. Mm -hmm. And for the... For some of our clients, it is easier for them to show up to groups virtually than it yeah. is when group is in person. So our attendance rates have not, have not been negatively impacted. In fact, they might be a little bit better. In I feel like it's going to change going forward. I mean... Right? I mean, if, if, if everyone finds that this is effective or as effective or whatever, I mean, 
are we going to just, I mean, this is all over the world, right? Like, are we just going to go back to what was in a lot of ways? You know what I mean? It's, I'm curious how it's all going to play out. I mean, I think it can certainly, and, and the next thing that I was going to talk about was, was research and the importance yeah. of really researching this type of treatment. It's new. It hasn't, we haven't right. been doing it long enough and collected enough data to come up with any major sort of statements of statistical significance. That said, we have started collecting data about things like um, oh, cool. treatment yeah. effectiveness, how clients are reacting to this, looking at symptoms, symptom reduction, looking yeah. at retention, looking at attendance. And thus far, the results are looking pretty promising. I don't think that virtual treatment will replace treatment as usual, but no. I think it can be an alternative mm -hmm. to treatment as usual for clients who can't access right. treatment as, as usual. We, um, at the beginning of the year last year, we launched a, a pretty significant outcome study for our treatment as usual model. We got approved through the Yale IRB so the goal is that once we collect some more data, we're still doing that study, but we're also gonna on the side be collecting data regarding our virtual treatment. And then we'll submit a new proposal to the IRB. So we'll have two studies running where yeah. we can compare treatment as usual to virtual, but you bring up a good point. Yeah. Um, I, I think that sometimes in crisis, sometimes good things can come out of crisis and maybe this I mean, I think it's great. I, I, honestly, I think if, 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 yeah, kids don't have to, I mean, especially for this, this quality of treatment, right? I mean, if you don't have to wait a week to go talk to somebody or whatever, anyway, this is a whole side. I didn't mean to hijack that. Um, but uh, I, I was just curious your thoughts, but I like the research piece. That's cool. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> In terms of research, we'll we'll keep you guys posted on that. We're co we're continuing to collect it, and we're we're certainly eager to share it with other treatment um, providers because this is it's it's important. It's important to be constantly holding yourself accountable and looking at yourself as a treatment organization and making sure that you're providing clients with the best possible services. Hey guys, thank you all for, for being here. We're super excited to have you. And you know, Maureen, to your point, it also allows for us to do things like this. Um, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been finding not even from a treatment perspective, but from an outreach perspective, I'm seeing people and connecting with people that I wouldn't necessarily see for years. And right. I think this affords tremendous opportunities for, for us to sort of think creatively about it just requires us to learn how to live more in a virtual world. Um, and I think ironically, we can learn a lot from our clients about how to do that. Um, I wanted to share, you know, some family feedback. Sarah alluded to sort of how this all went down for us. Um, just because New York was, was somewhat ahead of the curve in terms of cases, um, we, uh, we elected to, to go virtual a week in advance of any any restrictions in terms of um, groupings of people and that in in essence was another week in advance for DC as an example so I think for for families to get behind that took a lot of trust in particular um, what we did is we wanted to ensure that we worked out any kinks virtually um, I'm sure like a lot of us none of us could have imagined being here even eight weeks ago. Um, so the fact that we had a week where we could have still accessed in-person care, but we're doing it virtually to sort of offer a hybrid and understand what each client's unique needs were, you know, where were the gaps, um, where were the opportunities, you know, how involved did we need it to be around medication oversight, around wake-up support, or, you know, all the variables that, that again, you can't necessarily anticipate rather than just doing this overnight. So we took that week long period, which was extremely invaluable. Um, and these are, these are two quotes that we got from families during that first week. Um, and as you guys know, families, you know, uh, will provide feedback. It's, it's not always when you want them to provide feedback that they provide it. <laughs> and, you know, unsolicited to get these two quotes, you know, even within the first couple of days of transitioning virtual, I think was extremely encouraging for, for us. 
the next is um, we 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 launched a um, a virtual talent showcase last week. And please tell me our, you're going to sing this to us, John. He's going to sing it to you, actually. <laughs> John, you don't want me to sing it to you, Marie. <laughs> That's not my talent. Um, <laughs> Go ahead, Meredith. All right. Walk into the dorm on my very first day. So many board games I can't wait to play. Sit on down in my very first meeting. Did you and Jeff give a nice warm greeting? It's just a little sample for you all. <laughs> I think what what hit me the most, guys, is is if you go down to the chorus, which is the I think the fifth. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. And we can't share the same room, so we got to meet on Zoom. And in times like these, you got to weather the storm, so you go to the dorm. Yeah. And you know, uh, this this is a young man that that. Um, was attempting to get into the dorm and ran for a period of time and took a couple of months to, to come back. Um, and the fact that he's not only committed, but made the transition. And, and I think the biggest question for all of us in looking at virtual treatment is engagement. Um, and when you ask questions like socializing and um, you know community clubhouse and what does that all look like? And to say, you know, this came out of a virtual talent showcase that we had this past Friday night. Um, again, unsolicited, um, coming forward with just a tremendous amount of creativity. So I, 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 I can't be more proud of, um, of, of how much the clients, families have shown up. Um, and, uh, and, and again, how resilient these, these communities are. The last piece I wanted to share is, um, you know, as, as one of our core core values at the dorm is, is service. Um, we do a tremendous amount of service. And, and one of the things that we wanted to do for our clients to help with feeling like they can connect, because I think for all of us, we're, we're isolated. We're, we're in our homes, you know, for the first time, for some of us, you know, since leaving our parents' home, we're told what we can and cannot do. Um, and, and, and it can be very challenging and, and, um, and emotional. So being able to, to connect their engagement and activity to an opportunity to be of service is, is what we tried to focus on that first week as well. So we came up with a, um, a campaign to donate a dollar for every virtual session. Our clients, our parents attended in. It actually went into different campaigns that we launched from um, we did a, we did a gratitude week where they had to write gratitude lists every day. The parents were involved, the clients were involved. We did a random acts of kindness, um, campaign that we're doing this week. So again, we're really, we're tying all of these activities to, to donating a dollar a day to no kid hungry. Um, we got such a positive, um, response from mental health partners in the community, private practitioners that with Meredith's um, help, we put together a Connect to Give Back campaign within about 72 hours um, and launched it for all mental health providers to, to become a part of. So um, we're, we're nearing about $3,000 thus far um, that we've donated to No Kid Hungry. And, and our goal is by March 17th that we'll, uh, that we'll hit 10,000. Um, and it's incredible to say that at the dorm, we're doing 900 virtual sessions a week Crazy. between DC and New York. And we have truly been able to replicate everything we do um, online. And I, again, I, I couldn't imagine telling you that two months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it really brings chills just thinking about what we've been able to accomplish in such a short period of time. Um, and now it's really about how do we as healing professionals sustain this um, because we recognize that we don't know how long this is going to be going on for. Um, so we, before we move to our second half, which is um, really combating Zoom fatigue and talking about the sustainability of this, we wanted to answer any questions that you guys may have regarding the, the presentation. 
Well, I just appreciate you evolving into this because, you know, as you can imagine, as a consultant, it's like panic, right? Not, not for us so much, but our clients, like, what are we going to do? A lot of my clients went back home. Um, so I've been using, you know, parent coaching and the folks that I've always used before. Um, but it's nice, like, for, so what I'm gathering is that you all can be an option for those kids. Am I correct? Like if my students have gone home, can they do that? And are you opening to adolescents? Because <laughs> you're not doing enough sessions a week. But you know what I mean? Like that I just I feel like this is a nice model going forward. It's a model that works for a lot of my clients before this. Do you know what I mean? So I'm just really curious. I'm sort of back to the same question I guess I had before as far as like what does this look like going forward? Um, and I don't want to hijack the conversation. And I have another well, comment. Me, I just want to add that. So I got to hop off in about 10 minutes. Yeah, let me let me address that, Maureen, because it's a great question. I, I think it there, there's a couple of additional questions that we need to answer. Yeah. You know, as as a as sort of a when you look at um, global mental health and licensing in general, yeah. Yeah. Um, we as an organization feel um, very responsible as mental health providers to to be able to offer this service. I'm even talking to leaderships of, of different wilderness programs, of residential yeah. programs, that for some of them, they're going to have to shut down for a period of time. So what do they do with those clients? And we feel very confident, very comfortable stepping in because there's not many virtual options that are as comprehensive as what we just described. Right. Um, so can and will we work with those clients temporarily during this period of time? Absolutely. Okay. Great. Will we continue to service them once once this dies down and we understand how some of the restrictions will um, will impact our ability to do so? That that's the the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. um, my hope is that you know we'll have this moratorium for at least another twelve months, mm -hmm. understanding that this this will be likely impacting us for at least that amount of time um, and that it will lead towards universal licensing so that we can cross state bounds. But with the current, you know, licensing structure as it stood before this, we didn't have that ability. Um, so I think it's an open-ended question, but most importantly, we, we would happily step in um, if we can and they fit within our population presently. Great. Thanks, John. Of course. Welcome, Jody. I love your office. <laughs> um, any other questions guys Ben I see you here with us as well I'm here yeah welcome in the car we can't, we can't see you Ben oh that's why I'm in my car <laughs> <laughs> any other questions or can we move on well, yeah, I do have a quick question. You mentioned licensing. Um, yeah. How how would you propose doing that going forward, uh, both in terms of working with the states in which the kids or the young adults are currently domiciled and the licensure of your therapists? Oh. Are, are you talking about presently or, or once this dies down no going forward i mean you're 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 restricted now because your your clients are in either dc or in new york but supposing you were trying to provide this over a, a broader geographic area how would you do it or <coughs> we, we'd have we'd have to wait to see if there was any sort of universal initiative around licensing or we'd have to have each one of our therapists licensed in every state a client resided in yeah. Um, you know, there, there are certain organizations that, that specialize in telehealth. So again, we wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel. I think for us, it's looking at the efficacy of treatment because this, this was not why we started the dorm is to provide virtual treatment. And yet here we are. Um, in fact, many of our clients that discharged and even returning back to, to their universities, they would discharge from the dorm and we wouldn't continue seeing them. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking closely at the efficacy of treatment. Um, we're paying close attention to the engagement um, to see whether or not this would be a viable option looking at sort of treatment going forward. 
And then lastly, we're looking strongly at technology because I, I imagine when we're, it's easy to go from 100% in person to 100% virtual. The hard thing is going to be this sort of hybrid experience when half of our clients come back and the other half are still virtual. And what sort of technology will lend itself to creating a dynamic group experience with half of your people still at home and half of your people in person. So that's, that's where my head is, focusing on what kind of technology can exist to, to really support that hybrid experience. That's good, thanks. All right, Meredith, you wanna? Perfect, Amanda, I'll turn it over to you. You're on mute. I'm off mute now. There you go. <laughs> um, thank you. So we wanted to uh, talk about some topics on a weekly basis that we consider to be uh, timely in the virtual treatment world right now. And, and one theme, one topic that we have been keeping our eye on and that has been coming up in uh, clinical team meetings is this concept of Zoom fatigue and combating Zoom fatigue, sitting at a computer screen and interacting via a computer screen all day is, is exhausting, um, mentally, emotionally, physically. So how do we combat Zoom fatigue so that this type of model can be a sustainable model? Because it has to be sustainable right now. And uh, we sort of are looking at it from two different angles. A, how do we help our clients to combat Zoom fatigue? And B, how do we help our staff to combat Zoom fatigue? In some ways, I think it's almost, like I said, easier for the clients to transition into this type of model because they're used to doing so much online and with technology. That said, we do recognize that sitting in therapy group after therapy group after therapy group is, uh, is draining. So we've been doing a couple of things. First, uh, we're really trying to encourage our clients to, to move in between sessions, to, to move, to dance, to take a walk, to do something to alleviate the strain that takes place when you're sitting at a computer staring at a screen all day. We are making our groups 45 minutes instead of the conventional hour so that they have that 15 minutes in between groups to decompress, to get up, to walk around. We are looking at our schedule constantly to make sure that we are organizing things in a manner that they are getting our health and wellness, our integrated services in their schedule on a regular basis so that it's not just therapy groups all day. And then, you know, the last thing I think, and, and for a lot of our clients who are so socially minded, when you connect something like virtual treatment to a greater cause, to something outside of self, like connect to give back, it really helps them to combat some of that fatigue that's setting in, knowing that if they just show up to that group today, that's one extra dollar that gets donated to a really important cause. So for some of our clients who are in, you know, six groups a day, maybe two individual sessions a day, they just them alone might be donating eight, ten dollars to, to, to a really great cause. For team members, you know, this is so important because how we feel will impact the work that we do with clients. There is a parallel process that happens between a therapeutic team and a therapeutic community, between a therapist and between a client. So it's so important that we are taking care of ourselves so that we are able to then take care of our clients. They will pick up on our fatigue if we are not taking care of it. So as an organization, we, we recognize that this is a mental health crisis and that in many ways we are uh, first responders. I think that this, this pandemic is impacting people mentally in, in ways that are, that are just as intense as the ways that people are being impacted physically in some cases. So 
we're working really hard. We're working more than what we're used to. A lot of our weekends are spent working and, and on some of these sessions and, and involved in different groups. So how do we help our staff to, to stay healthy during this? We have been offering staff wellness activities. So we have our own yoga and Zumba and exercise classes that we are doing as a staff. We are doing little social activities, coffee breaks and lunch breaks virtually as a staff. We started a, a little trend, a little initiative called Foodie Fridays, where every Friday we get a meal delivered to each staff person's house and we have lunch together. We are meeting daily as a team and doing virtual team meetings daily. One of those team meetings, we are not allowed to talk about clients. We only talk about ourselves and how we are feeling. We also have decided that for each day, for each month that we are engaged in virtual treatment, we will give each staff member an additional day off in their benefits package and they can roll over days that they're not able to use now due to the coronavirus. We're hoping that having that light at the end of the tunnel and knowing that we'll be able to take extra time when this is over and this crisis has waned can help us sort of get through this, this mini marathon for right now. And then again, our staff, you know, we get into this work because we want to help others. And while it's amazing that we're able to do the work that we're doing with dorm clients, there's so many people out there who aren't able to access necessary treatment and food and shelter and all those sort of basic necessities in life. So knowing that as a part of the dorm, every time that we help our clients to show up, we are also giving back to a greater cause and to uh, children in, in need is, is inspiring to our staff and, and helps us to get through this time as well. So I, I think a lot of the tips that we gave to clients are also important for, for all mental health providers. And at this point, I sort of wanted to open it up to a general conversation about what, what are we doing as mental health providers? What are you guys doing to take care of yourselves during this time? What's working? What's not working? Um. It's funny because we just started a uh, online Peloton group. So there's a bunch of us that are hopping on the same ride. You know, you can, everybody has each other's names. So it's kind of, that's been one thing I think. And then just Zoom social calls, you know, not the, not the business ones, but connecting with those folks that you really, you know, you miss, you miss seeing and, and all of that. And we were talking the other day that it's, it's going to be weird if things ever really get back to normal because there's going to be some withdrawal on like social connection. Like in some ways I'm more socially connected now than I was previously with my friends that are far away, my local friends, of course, but it's going to be an interesting dynamic and um, you know, we'll see how it all plays out. But um, so that's, that's a few of the things that we're doing. You guys, I'm so sorry, but I have another Zoom <laughs> at four that I have to hop on. So I can't thank you enough for your time, and I'm going to hop off, and I'll – thanks, John, for inviting me. I appreciate it. Good to meet yeah. you all. Denny, good to see you. <laughs> yes, you, you too. I know, I know. I have to jump off also, but I was going to say, you know, I know for me, I schedule, like, I in my mind, I, okay, 9 o'clock is yoga. I do a class, an online class in yoga, and I'm, you know, I told Tracy today. I just try to schedule certain like mental health uh, activities like walking and, you know, the things that really feed me mm -hmm. uh, that are relaxing and listening to podcasts, of course, from the New York Times. <laughs> so I, Netflix. Still, yes. And, well, yes, yes. That's like after in the evening. No That's more right. Trying to evening. keep it as normal as possible, I think, has been key, right? Like get up, go to work. You finish the day and and have your normal evening. I think that's yeah. Been, that's yeah, but this Zoom is just amazing. Yeah, you know, it's it awesome. Twenty relatives wishing my nephew a happy birthday oh. the other day. There were twenty of us on the call. I mean, from all yeah. over the world. So it was. 
That's cool. Hopefully, hopefully That's these cool. are the things that we can we can hold on to. Yes. Bye, bye, bye. bye, Maureen. Bye. Yeah, I got to run too. Thank you so much. This bye, Denny. Everyone. Thanks, Denny. I, I have to jump to too. I'm so sorry. Bye, Jody. Yeah. I have to jump. Sorry. Thank you. I hope you guys will keep us connected. Good seeing you, John. Absolutely. Take care. Nice meeting you, Amanda. Bye, Tracy. Bye. You too. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Ben. Hey, goodbye. Thanks a lot, guys. Take care, Ben. Thanks again. Bye, Ben.